Great. So so my, so my talk. Um, so for those of you who know me and my work, I primarily work primarily work on like a differential privacy, and I mostly work on the kind of like algorithm design side. Um, but I think focusing on this version of the work misses a key aspect, which is like, um, how can we bring all of these algorithms into practice? Um, and so I will talk today about a, like a behavioral experiment that we did, and this is joint work with like Imbal Dekel, Roy Chefetz, and um, Katrina Bligett. All of them are at um, Hebrew U, half in the CS department, half in the econ department. <laughs> And like in this work, we tried to estimate what is a value for privacy as a function of the parameters that arise in the like a differential privacy definition. And so now I will start with a brief overview of the like a differential privacy the definition. And so this is not going to be a kind of algorithmic talk, but I think it's important that we first understand what is this algorithmic technique that we're trying to kind of understand in a broader scheme. Great, great. And so like um, differential privacy was defined back in 2006 by like Dwork McSherry Seaman Smith. And he said, really, really privacy is gonna be about promising people freedom from harm. No harm is going to come to you because you shared your data with some analysis process. And like a little bit more precisely, they're going to say some analysis of a data set is gonna be considered private. If the analyst knows almost no more about a particular person, Alice, after the analysis, then he would have known had he conducted the same analysis on the same database, but with kind of Alice's data removed. And so we're considering two possible like a counterfactual worlds. One of them contains their data and one of them doesn't. Everything else is the same. And if we're saying, I'm gonna learn about the same thing on these two worlds, then we're really saying, I'm not learning from you specifically, I'm learning I'm learning like I'm from the population. And this expression here, almost no more. And this gives us a privacy parameter. How much is almost? And like a little bit more precisely in pictures, imagine if you take your favorite data set and you plug it into your favorite algorithm. And let's say this is a randomized algorithm. And so this is gonna produce a like PDF of the outputs of the curves. And so this says uh, um, the kind of like on the x-axis, imagine like all possible things that may be like produced as a result of this algorithm. It may be like, you know, the correlation between smoking and lung cancer. It may be like, you know, targeted ads for you. And like on this y-axis, we're gonna have like uh, the probability of having that thing occur as a result of this algorithm instantiated on this particular database. And so now imagine if I were to swap out Alice's data with some new person, Javier, and, and like plug that into the same algorithm. Well, then I'm gonna get out a slightly different curve. And the question is gonna be how close are these curves? And in particular, we're gonna be concerned with with a ratio point wise between the, these curves. How, why is this like an appropriate privacy notion? It's because if I observe this particular output occurring and I then try to make inferences that I observe this output because of Alice or because of Javier, um, I can't really make any inferences because this event would occur with like about the same probability under these two possible databases. Even more precisely, and here's the actual full, full version, we will say that an algorithm M, the maps from like an N tuple of types. And so think of this as, as kind of like a database containing N people's data into some arbitrary output range R is going to be parameterized epsilon differentially private. If it is the case that um, for all neighboring databases, D and D prime, and these are the same except for one person's data. And like uh, for all possible things I may produce as a result of the analysis, I'm going to produce that thing. <laughs> about the same probability under these two neighboring databases. And this like about the same is gonna have a bounded ratio according to this term E um, to the epsilon. 
And so this is going to be a strong, like a worst case guarantee over all possible pairs of neighboring databases and over all possible things that may be produced as a result of the analysis. And so effectively, we're kind of bounding what is a like maximum amount one person's data um, can change the result of this analysis. And so we have this privacy parameter epsilon. And like um, the first thing you might notice is that this is not a particularly natural way to like describe privacy. We probably don't think about the like, you know, exponent of the worst case bound of ratios of some outcomes after changing your, your data. That's not really how we like think about privacy in the real world. And this is in part a part of this work. Um, this epsilon parameter can range between like between like um two extremes. On one hand, we have like a complete privacy. If we set like epsilon to, to be zero, then these things have to be equal. And so this is saying the thing that I produce has to be in, independent of the data. On the other hand, if I set like um, epsilon equals infinity, then kind of like a, this bound has no byte whatsoever and things are not constrained at all. And so that is a no privacy constraint. What is interesting is that we can now, we can now move um, smoothly between these two, two extremes through this like uh, parameter epsilon. And this is not just a single definition, but in fact, over the last like um, decade and a half, the like a computer science community has worked very hard to produce a like a diverse algorithmic toolkit of like a differentially private algorithms across a whole bunch of different like you know computational environments, and these things are also being deployed in practice by both the like government and major tech companies. And these are like only a few examples, um, um, but there's more. <laughs> and so now like, I'd like to kind of emphasize a connection between computer science and like, and like econ, because I know that is the like a uh, point of this conference. Um, and in fact, I think both fields can like uh, contribute to each other through the lens of uh, differential privacy. On the like um, CS side, like a differential privacy theory is like a purposely silent about the appropriate choice of epsilon. And we just say in our papers and the conclusions, the analyst should pick epsilon to balance a trade off between the privacy of the individuals and the accuracy of the analysts. This sounds from a kind of like economics perspective, has this as if there's some like an you know, optimization problem be between kind of like a two different utility functions. And the like a computer science space gives a very good job of kind of like uh, describing for a particular algorithm, how does the accuracy look as a function of the epsilon parameter? And so in fact, we do have like a pretty good understanding of how we can map this into a function. We don't have a very good understanding of how we can map this into a function. And so then, and so then this raises the like um, question, how can we measure utility for privacy as a function of this epsilon parameter that is unfortunately not particularly organic? On the other hand, economics, economics has a very like um, well-established body of work saying that like a behavior is different under like a complete privacy versus no privacy conditions. And we have like you know, a very large body of work establishing this under various like, you know, behavioral experiments. Um, but there are very few works considering things in between. And so in this case, we can have our kind of like an epsilon value move like I'm smoothly between these two. And in fact, the one exception is one that we are actually going to like um, build our experiment upon with this one. Additionally, like um, economics models often include some kind of like, you know, visibility parameters in particular. In particular, this work has a model of like a pro-social behavior where the like a visibility of behavior is included in the model. Although the units of this parameter are typically unspecified and play like you know, a pretty major role in the model outcome and the empirical 
measurements. And so again, it'd be great if we can kind of incorporate like an epsilon differential privacy as a way to make these like um, visibility parameters more like um, precise. And as a preview of what's coming, I'm going to talk much more about the like a behavioral experiment and the kind of and the kind of like empirical measurement side. I will have one slide talking about how we do this part in the paper, um, but I won't actually spend any time on it today. So another question, how do people value their privacy? And I think it's important to acknowledge we're not just moving between two fields like uh, like um, computer science and like econ, we're also moving between theory and practice. Um, and so in theory, we say people are rational utility maximizers, and we can ask about the like, you know, functional form of this like, utility function, we're always going to assume they're making rational choices. Um, in practice, you see things that look like this. Um, and this is a like a performance art piece um, where people truly did give away um, their birth date, their mother's maiden name, the last four of their social and their photograph in exchange for a cookie. And by and large, they did it. So maybe also there's a gap between theory and practice as we're trying to like uh, deploy differential privacy and to measure people's value for their privacy. And so our main questions we want to address are, first of all, do people even value privacy at all, or will they hand it away for like a free cookie? Um, um, and if the answer is yes, they do value pri privacy, what are the structural properties of that privacy function? Uh, and do you think that this is cultural? It depend, the, the people's attitudes depend on which culture they are coming from? Oh, very think... much so, yes. very much so. Um, and so we conducted our experiment at like um, Cornell. Most of our most of our participants were like um, Cornell students. And so that certainly gives a bias, I think both in terms of the people participating, but then also in terms of the like type of data that we used, that I'll explain next. But you're right. Um, and I also think our questions are phrased in this general way because we're not really asking what is the value of choosing epsilon equals one because that will certainly like you know depend on the context but questions like do people value privacy um i think that is something that will extend across cultural differences and types of data and the exact like you know quantitative measures may be different but i think that we can answer qualitative questions of this form Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. And so the question then becomes, how can I use like embarrassing data in the lab? And ideally, I might want to use something that people actually feel embarrassed about. Transcripts, medical history, deep, dark personal secrets that I can like I'll blackmail them with. Um, but for the obvious reasons, we should not be doing that. Um, 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 on the other hand, I can maybe like, you know, make up data for them and they can tell you, here's your data, be embarrassed about it. Um, but they won't really have any reason to value privacy besides like, you know, explicit, explicit, like, you know, payments in the experiment. And we're not trying to reason about how well can they solve randomized math problems. We're trying, but we're like, I'm trying, trying to capture the kind of intrinsic value of their private data. So instead, we're going to go in between. We're going to like um, create data from their behavior in the lab, um, data they might be concerned about having shared, but it's OK and it won't ruin their lives if it is shared. Um, um, and I will pause here and say, of course, everything was approved by our like, institute's IRB. So here's our experiment that we ended up at. And the kind of like um, core of the experiment is a public goods game. I think for the, for the like, you know, economists here, you can kind of zone out for the next minute. And for the like um, computer scientists, I'm not sure if this is new. So we, ha so we had like um, 300 and like uh, 28 subjects come into the lab in like um, groups of eight. And so this was like, uh, and so this was like, um, 41 sessions of groups of eight. 
and and they all played a like a public goods game in the group of eight where basically like um, each person got to uh, divide their like $10 endowment between their personal account and their group account um, in kind of whole dollar amounts. And like um, for each dollar they, they capped, it gives them $1 and it gives nothing to like everyone else. And then like um, for each dollar they put into the group account, um, they have an internal return of like um, 30 cents to themselves. And, and they have like an external return of like either um, 30 cents or like um, um, 50 cents per person to the other people in the group. So their payment in dollars is they get, as if we're gonna call like um, the amount they contribute to the like um, group account, her like um, contribution. So then she's going to get all the dollars that she keeps. And then she's gonna get 0.3 times, times like um, the amount that she puts in the group account. And then she'll either get like a 0.3 or 0.5 times like um, the sum of the contributions of the others in her group. Rachel, Rachel do, they, do they see each other or it's all the others are anonymous? They are in fact in the same room. I see. In the same room, yeah. Yeah. Um, and we chose these particular values because it is a, because it is a dominant strategy for players to like um, contribute zero dollars and to keep everything and that's how they can maximize utility but if they want to maximize efficiency of the overall welfare of the players and they should like um contribute the full amount to the group and so effectively they're kind of like a private data it's like um the amount that they contribute and if they are more selfish they will keep more and if they are more generous then they will give more and therefore we have something that they may have concerns about being shared with like on um, the others in the room and then afterwards we gave a like noisy allocation decision and these were like a uh, publicly announced and they have some like on um, screenshots next of what they 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 saw um and we said with probability one um minus p then your true allocation decision is going to be announced um, for each person. And with probability P, I'm going to pick a random allocation and I'm going to announce that. And we varied P between like zero and one. And this, um, and this like, um, and this like, um, and this like, um, corresponds to the like a complete privacy and the no privacy conditions. And they knew in advance these would happen. And we also had like um, comprehension checks to kind of make sure that they really understood these things. And they played the game seven times in a row um, for these seven different p values um, um, happening in a random order. Everyone in the same session had the same order, but the order was like um, randomized across sessions. Um, and then afterwards, one round what was like a chosen randomly to like um, decide announcements and payments. And there was no information shared across rounds um, to make sure there was no like an adaptive, adaptive approach happening here. Um, and we emphasize payments were based on the true allocation decisions, not the announcements. And so we told them the announcement may or may not match your actual payment. And so here are some screenshots of what they saw on the first task out of seven. Here is the text and we like you know, instructed them. And these parameters are the ones that were varied across different treatments. And they got to, and they got to like allocate dollars into their personal account. And they were told how much that um, pays everyone. And also the same thing into the group account and the appropriate payments and they said things have to be whole numbers and some up to their entire endowment and we also told them about the chance of the announcement. When it came time for them to randomize, um, we showed them both a roulette wheel and a die because like our previous work has shown humans are pretty bad at like a reasoning about like um about like um 
probabilities, but if you show them a visual um, 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 then it helps. And so we showed them a roulette wheel that was colored. And we said, if your spin is one of these and we're going to announce your true decision, if your spin is a red one, they will announce a random allocation. And then like a die roll will like um, decide what is announced. And their announcements looked like this. And so we told them, what is a task that we're going to do announcements on? What are the odds in that task? And then here's the, 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 the like announcements. And we had everyone stand up one by one according to their number when it was their time to like uh, be announced individually. And so it really was public, public, to, to the rest of the group and their behavior was reported on like individual level. So our hypotheses, so we're basically giving a mapping from the true privacy level in terms of privacy um, to the perceived privacy level. And like, as I mentioned before, we have like a pretty strong evidence, people behave differently at these extremes. And we're curious what happens in between. And there are three possible hypotheses. And of course, these are very much stylized uh, plots. Um, but you might imagine something along these lines is like possible. And the first one is our theory of like a plausible deniability. Even if you have like any amount of privacy whatsoever, if there's even like any, any like a possibility of noise, then you can say, I know it looks like I kept all the money, but that wasn't me. That was only noise. At the other extreme, people may have this kind of like all or nothing attitude. And if there's like any chance of their data being revealed, and that will cause them to behave in a much more like a pro-social way and to contribute more of their like money. Or you might imagine something in between, perhaps in a line, perhaps like, you know, concave convex, um, but something that looks roughly linear and smooth, and we don't see like a difference at the extreme of values. And before we can actually plot these things for like our experiments, we have to think about, I have to think about what is the appropriate privacy parameter to use? And we might have this kind of like an you know, organic parameter in the experiment P. We might have our like a differential privacy parameter epsilon, or we might have this like, you know, bound on the ratios E um, to the epsilon. And for time, I will skip this part, but this basically shows how you go from the P to the epsilon. And it's like, you know, four lines of math and it's very simple, um, but effectively, but, but effectively our like um, P values roughly correspond to like, you know, these epsilon values ranging between like infinity to like zero in between we have about half, one and a half, two and a half, three and a half, five and a half. Um, so here's our findings and we plot these in like, a, in like um, two separate ways. Um, so on both of these, we're gonna have participants like participants like uh, like um, like uh, like um, average um, contribution on the y-axis and and like on the x-axis we're going to have our different privacy parameters ranging between like um, completely public into completely private and so here on this x-axis we have um, we have the like um, probability P of announcing a random allocation. Um, on the top x-axis, we have epsilon. And like, it's important to see um, while these are plotted linearly, these are not because these go from like um, zero to infinity. Um, but in fact, for kind of like lower epsilon values, there is roughly like a linear relationship between the kind of epsilon and the p. Oops. Over here, we have, um, on this axis, e um, to the epsilon, and we see there's a like you know, there's a kind of like discontinuity head infinity, and things are much much larger to 10, 34, 12, all the way down. And so this parameter is going to be much larger. And so here's our findings. First of all, 
first of all, we like um, confirm um, that people behave very differently under these no privacy and the full privacy extremes, like here to here. Um, and these confidence intervals are at like 95%. And so we see significant difference between our two privacy extremes. And so this confirms everything that we have seen before. And it says we are at least on the right track. Um, and we have a decrease of about like, you know, a dollar and a half between these extremes. As we look in between, we do see here behaviors like roughly linear in P. It's not perfect, but it's pretty close. And so this tells us maybe we're looking something more like this, like, you know, constant marginal returns. Uh, Rachel, you have uh, three minutes. Um... Uh, so just keep that keep that in mind. Thanks. Yes, yes. Um, um, and so for small epsilon, we also see things are roughly linear. For a small, like you know, smaller, like you know, basically on this on this end, things are also roughly linear because of this relationship between like epsilon and p. Um, for large epsilon, things of course diverge to infinity, and so this kind of Linearity breaks down um, 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 because it's not possible for people to kind of exhibit like a divergent behavior, contribute like you know, infinite dollars as a privacy parameter that goes off to infinity. Um, over here we see we see that kind of like a, this plot is is probably not the right parameter to like um, consider because it like uh, clumps up all the important things in one corner. And so we're not really getting to see or to like uh, distinguish what's happening at these kind of like meaningful epsilon values because they're all very much compressed. And so this tells us if we're looking for a, for a privacy parameter, um, probably this expression E um, to the epsilon is not the right one. And finally, we see that we can reject behavior at these like intermediate privacy values as being um, as being the same as the extreme values, zero and one. Um, we actually cannot reject the things are nonlinear. Um, we also can't reject linear. Sorry, sorry. We like um, can't reject linearity. Um, we also can't reject a flat part in the middle. And so this also tells us at a high level, we're looking something more like our marginal returns being um, constant. We can't really say that they're definitely constant. And this is also a case, a case where a case where a case for like you know, application dependent things may arise. Well, uh, the time is almost up, Rachel. Huh. Fantastic. One more minute. Thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. um, great. I'll skip this part. I mentioned at the beginning, we do fit a model of like a pro-social behavior based on the privacy parameter. And I will just like um, conclude here. And these are the things that I just mentioned. And I think like an important note for the future work is that we do operate in a very stylized setting in the lab. And I think more work expanding this into other like, you know, privacy parameter settings, other types of data would be very interesting to see here. Thank you.